So to start, whoever does not know us, I wanted to talk about Sustainable Kashi. So we are Sustainable Kashi. We are an interactive demonstration program with an off-grid eco village that captures rainwater. We use alternative energy. We have nine demonstration gardens nested in all the intentional community. And we are dedicated to educating others around environmental sustainability and regenerative lifestyles and regenerative living. We run a three-week work exchange program. We have workshops, we have classes, and our favorite is our free Wednesday permaculture classes. So we typically do those in person, but now we're having this online platform to share with so many of you, and we're extremely excited to be able to share this gift with all of you during this time. So today our focus is going to be on where everything starts and where everything ends, which is compost. So last week we discussed permaculture ethics and really laying down the foundation of ethics, which are earth care, people care, and fair share. We talked a little bit about principles. So today we're gonna to start on creating compost. So there are so many different ways of composting and we're gonna focus on how we compost here at Sustainable Kashi and what's worked for us but I really felt called to share composting today because that is where the health begins with everything. And right now we're facing a time of disease within our society. And if we're not taking care of ourselves and we're not taking care of the soil, then we're gonna end up with plants that are really prone to diseases, pests, insects, um, a plethora of problems. So I felt it was really important to bring it back to the basics of compost and start there. So in compost, we can reflect on our own inner landscape. So permaculture, we sometimes forget that we are an integral part of our ecosystem and we need to cultivate our own inner landscape as well as the outer landscape. I remember last week when someone brought up of, um, incorporating the permaculture principles into our lives and really taking those and seeing how we can integrate them daily. So the same with ourselves with compost, right? What can we do in our lives to really nurture our own fertile soil? What can we do to really create a ground foundation where we're strong, healthy, and vibrant during these times? Because we can really be focusing on all the fear and all the news and all the things that are going on outside of us. Cool. But it's really important that we take that time and make sure that we're centered and strong within our own fertile soil. So I wanted to pose the question to everyone of what are you doing to create healthy soil within your life right now? And I'll take five answers to this question if there are five people who would like to answer. That would be amazing to answer. You would just go to the participants section and raise your hand. There's a raise hand section. And I will wait. The question again is what are you doing right now in your life to cultivate fertile soil? What are you doing to make sure that your soil is strong? Alana, if you could just unmute yourself and answer the question. Thanks. Um, so we really just started with this all now that we've been home and everything like that, but we started, um, first we just started like with banana peels because I heard that you could just like toss them around the soil. They like decompose really quickly. And now we actually just started like, I don't know if we're doing it exactly right, but like trench, we made like a hole basically. And we started doing like a little bit of trench composting, but like very, just really started. And then we'll, we put some things in and then we put, um, like the, the brown matter, I guess, like the leaves and like the um, some malt, like soil, I guess. And I don't know if we're doing it right, but that's what we started. I'm really, really excited. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for sharing. And we're going to get all to the specifics of compost today. So you'll get to learn more about it. Thank you. Um, Natanya, can you unmute yourself and answer the question? Yes. Um, I have been composting for a while, actually. I take all my food scraps and I put it in a, a tumbler. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, 
the tumbler gets full and now I've got buckets full of compost. <laughs> wow. but my problem more is, uh, is I, I'm not really sure how to use the compost afterwards, but uh, after it's so rich and beautiful, but um, I do, I take all of my, uh, I also have an Airbnb and they, uh, all my guests are required to compost as well. So, or at least put it in a tin in my refrigerator. So I use it a little bit, but mostly I'm just composting now. I, I don't know. I think that I'm doing it right by putting everything, up, putting all the scraps in there and a little bit of dirt and maybe some leaves. Yeah, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for being part of the change. Thank you, Thank Natanya. You. And Jessica Long, could you unmute yourself for the question? Yeah, I'm also teaching kindergarten, so you hear a lot of yelling. That's what it is. Oh. Um, what we're doing, like, what to make sure that we're, you know, keeping our lives, like, our compost. We got all the worms and stuff outside, and really gardening is a big part of that. Going outside and growing something, mm -hmm. while we're not really allowed to be growing, like, relationships and friendships and stuff right now is really helping. Um, we're doing like a daily yoga practice and stuff like that. And, um, like the gardening and the composting is a good, it's good to include in that, um, wellness for mm -hmm. self because, you know, you're going outside, you're actually breathing fresh this. air. It's really helpful. Absolutely. Thank you for tying that back into the inner landscape. I absolutely love that. It is so important to be taking care of our own soil right now. Thank you, Jessica. Does anyone else have an answer to the question for this morning? We have a lot of hands. Okay. Gina, could you answer the question? Oh, which Gina? It says Gina's iPhone. <laughs> well, I'll just say something quickly. I'm a Gina. Um, basically, oh. I've been Tumblr composting, but then my dad was living here for a while and he just started dumping so much stuff in there and he wasn't spinning it and, and it was ruined. So I dumped it all out and I was starting over and I was watching a lot of videos on YouTube and I saw something talking about pine pellets because what was going wrong with my compost was it was too wet and I just didn't have enough dry stuff around to really like get in there. Mm -hmm. So I stopped at like a horse feed store and I got a bag of pine pellets. So I put a little bit of pine pellets in the bottom of my pail each time before I pour it in, and now it's working beautifully. Amazing. So I, I got my dry and my wet going good, so. <laughs> awesome, happy for you, Gina. Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll take one more answer. Uh, Tammy B, could you unmute yourself? Hi, the only thing I have done is basically any eggshells, I let them dry hmm. and then I sprinkle them in the garden and I also use the old coffee grains. Awesome, well that is definitely a step towards composting. So hopefully we can provide you with more information today that can give you more of a guide on how to do that. But thank you so much for sharing. All right, so now we are going to go to the PowerPoint. And you're going to screen share. Mm -hmm. So the PowerPoint should show up on your on your screen. Do you see that? Yeah, I can't see. Hold on. Yep. All right. Okay, so we're going to dive into compost today. So I'm going to just go over the basics about composting, and then I'm going to hand it off to Jeff, and he's going to go more into the microbiology of soil and soil sciences. So we're just going to start with the basics, go from patterns, and then work our way over to the details. So... So why compost? So healthy soil equals healthy plants. Without having healthy soil, we don't have a healthy environment for plants to withstand diseases and pests. 
typically when the plants are suffering from different diseases, it's because of the soil quality. And 20% of household waste is organic material. That, those are incredible resources that we can be using to cultivate healthy soil within our garden. So there really is no waste in nature. When we step back and we look at a forest, everything is recycled. Everything is put back into its perfect, perfection place. So we're really focusing on keeping that closed loop system, cultivating microorganisms, which helps with the retention of water and nutrients. And we'll get into how Florida's soil is with holding on to water and holding on to nutrients. Another aspect of composting is creating organic matter. So 50% of soil is organic matter, and this organic matter helps provide nutrients to your plants, and microorganisms come in and they help break down the organic matter into basic elements, which enable plants to absorb it and use it. So without these microorganisms, the plants aren't going to have anything to feed off of. So we're not necessarily focused on growing plants in our garden as much as we are focused on growing healthy soil. So this is where it all begins. This is where it all starts. This is the most crucial point. And to get back to the closed loop section, in permaculture, we aim to practice keeping the loop closed as much as we can. So this means that all of our resources and nutrients come back to its original source. This allows our energy to be centralized without needing any extra fossil fuels to process or gain resources. So the cycle is we grow our own food, we compost excess food scraps and browns that create compost for our gardens, and then we continue to grow our food from there. So Florida's sandy soils. If you're living in Florida, you know all about this. Florida is pretty much pure sand. And when you dig into our soil, you don't typically see a lot of microorganisms going on in there. We don't see a lot of activity going on. It's almost lifeless. So with our sandy soils, we don't have any water retention. Either. Oops, sorry about that, guys. Okay, if everyone can make sure to mute themselves again, just in case we don't have that problem. Okay. So by applying compost, we're able to increase our water retention, and it also provides a space for nutrients to be stored. So the nutrients in water typically leaches away in Florida's sandy soil. So when we're adding the compost, we're really increasing the water retention and adding organic material into our garden. And not only compost, but if you add mulch, if you have chop and drop crops like Mexican sunflower or pigeon pea, those are great crops you can use to add organic matter to your soil. So then we're gonna go into a healthy compost pile. So the magic of compost rests in the interaction between browns and greens. So our greens are gonna be nitrogen. Good. Our greens are gonna be um, nitrogen. And then our browns is what's going to be our carbon. So a ratio that we go by is one to three, one nitrogen and three carbon. And when we're speaking of greens and nitrogen, this is going to be like food scraps, manures, green lawn clippings, green leaves, providing that source of nitrogen. Typically anything that you leave out that smells is going to be what your nitrogen is. So if you're composting poop, that smells. So that's going to be a nitrogen. Your carbon rich material is going to be mulch, branches, stems, dry leaves, or straw, giving the compost its light and fluffy body. The bulkiness of the brown materials allows oxygen to penetrate and nourish the organisms that reside in the compost. And if you have too much nitrogen, it makes for a dense and smelly and slow decomposing anaerobic mass. So you're really wanting to make sure that this ratio is one to three. And we have a three by three by three pile at Kashi 
that works perfectly and it's kept in the shade. So a lot of people have questions of why their compost isn't working and a lot of the times I see that their compost is left in full sun and the nutrients are completely getting baked out of the compost pile and that it's dry from being left in the sun. And when you think about the water that you're putting in your compost pile, we actually don't water our compost at Kashi because it's kept in this beautiful shaded area and it's always moist from the Florida natural adding some water is good but for the most part if anything we have to cover it up because it gets too much water so really making sure that it's kept in the shade and um, not allowing those nutrients to be leached out by the sun also a lot of people get alarmed at the smell of compost a question is why is my compost pile so smelly and that means that there's not enough browns in the compost pile. So there's too much nitrogen that's sitting on the compost pile. Or if you leave nitrogen on the top and you have all these flies on it, definitely keeping it covered with browns is the way to go. Okay, so this is what our beautiful compost pile looks like at Kashi. It's three by three by three. And if you have it any larger than this, One second. On. We got excited. We wanted to show it to you all really quick. There we go. Okay, so anything larger than three by three is going to compact and restrict airflow. So this is our beautiful pile that we have. And then we'll show you our system. So our system right there, you can see the different piles that we have and we alternate these piles and we let them sit for three months. So, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to wait for three months and there's a lot of different composting methods. This is just our method that works well for us. You know, there's the Berkeley method where you can make compost within 17 days and heating it up. We actually don't turn our piles. So we let them decompose and all the bacteria come in, the microorganisms break it down and keep the heat and nutrients centralized within the pile. So we see these piles heat up to about 150 degrees and then we compost them when, or we harvest the compost whenever it's at 80 degrees. So these different piles, since we have a few different piles, we're able to continuously have compost on hand. So if you have a section like this in your backyard, I would definitely recommend it. Um, you can also turn the pile if you wanted it to be done faster, but you know, nature has its own course. And if we allow for nature to just completely decompose these piles, then we're getting really beautiful compost. We're allowing the microorganisms to come in and really start to break down all this compost. And over there in the corner on the left-hand side is our sifter. So in this picture, in our compost section, we have a few piles going on. We have our new pile that's being created. In the back right corner, we have our worm jacuzzi. So that's where we add fertilization to our compost piles. And then we have a storage for our worm casting so we can make worm tea and our sifter where we sift the compost. So sifting compost. When is the compost ready? Typically when it appears crumbly and dark and looks and smells like soil. So when you open your compost pile and it's super smelly and really, really hot, that means that the compost is not ready. So we have a thermometer on all of our compost piles. I would definitely recommend doing that. It makes the process a lot easier. And whenever it's 80 degrees is when we harvest it. But we just put it on this sifter and you get in there on the sides and you just shake it all out and you have a wheelbarrow underneath. So that collects all the beautiful compost and takes out anything that's big and bulky. That sits on top. So what we do with what sits on top is we inoculate our next pile with what was breaking down because that has a bunch of microorganisms that are already coming in and breaking down the compost. We take that and we inoculate and speed up our next compost piles with that. And then our finished compost. This beautiful, amazing soil comes from 
our own compost, our own food scraps. And we, we compost for 80 residents who live here. So we do get a good amount of food scraps that we're putting in there. But after three months, we go and we, oh, that's okay, you could go to the next one. After we go and we add the compost into the garden. So there's two different ways that we typically add our compost into our gardens. And for who spoke in the beginning and was talking about having all this excess compost, we either take a wheelbarrow and we'll put it into a garden bed, but the main way that we add all this compost into our gardens is by putting it into the nursery. So this is a picture of our nursery and we put all of our plants into four inch pots. And then we're adding all of that right back into the garden. And I'm trying to remember the amount that we add in. I think it's two inches, yeah. Two inches, oh, it's over there. Two inches of compost to our gardens every season. So it's, it's incredible how much we can add to our gardens by just creating the compost and putting it into the nursery and then putting it back into the garden. And then adding fertility. So compost is basically neutral and we're really creating the soil aggregate, the soil structure for microorganisms to live in, for it to hold water and for it to hold nutrients, but we're not really adding too many or too much nutrients to the garden by creating compost. So we add in worm castings, worm tea, we make compost tea. I know that Jeff makes fermented plant juice, which is incredible. You can grow specific plants to make your own fermented plant juice that you can add. And we use our home biogas effluent. So we have a home biogas digester that takes in all of our food and it's pretty much like a human stomach. And it creates this effluent from the humus that's down inside of the home biogas system. And we use that ratio one to four, one to four parts water into our gardens and it flourishes. So when we create the compost, it gives something for the fertility to hold on to. It's like a storage battery. And then the microorganisms come in, they break down all that, they poop it out and make it uptakeable by the plants. So Really, when we talk about compost, we're talking about creating that soil structure and that soil aggregate for all those microorganisms and all the nutrients to come in and be able to be stored instead of sand, where that's just leached away and washed away. So get to composting. If you're in an apartment and you don't have an area to compost, you can totally create a worm compost bin and compost with worms. I did that for a few years and it worked really, really well. And then you can put that into little pots if you want to, and you can give away worm castings to other people. And if you can't compost it, I think the best that we can do is try to reduce and reuse and recycle it. Or find a local space. I know in Orlando they have a composting, O-Town Compost. They come and they pick up compost, and there's a lot of great systems that are out there. So definitely making sure that we're keeping it closed loop and we're allowing ourselves to create as much fertility as possible. So now we're gonna switch it over to Jeff. So Jeff, if you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself and give us a little more information about composting. All right, hello everyone. I'm Jeff Trapani, uh, the director of Orlando Permaculture here in Orlando, we're a nonprofit, we say we help build community minds and food. And I just have some slides I'm gonna share with you right now. If I can pop it up here, let's see what happens. All right, so let me know if you guys, good, okay, great. All right, um, <clears throat> so about 500 million years ago, this planet looked largely like Mars or the moon. There really wasn't much on there. We had some bacteria and fungi, maybe some lichen, but before plants emerged, this was pretty much a dry, desolate area, okay? But once we got plants moving from the water onto the earth, then photosynthesis begins on land and we start to get the carbon dioxide which was 12 times higher in the atmosphere at that time 
and start to pump it into the ground and start to feed the bacteria and the fungi that are, that are, that are in the soil and get this process going. And so now we end up with a more balanced climate, fresh water, fertile soil, and this, these are the conditions for life to begin. So it's like, what is going on in the ground that is allowing this whole process to happen, for life to happen, for high nutrient plants to be growing? Um, and that's what I'll be showing you a little bit today. And hmm, I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, great. So where does a tree come from? Now, when you look at a tree, you got the, the leaves, the branches, the bark. I went to Redwood Forest out in the North California um, two years ago, and let's look at these redwood trees, and it's like, where does all of this matter come from, right? And a lot of us think probably that it comes from, from the ground, but if it did, you would, you would see that the ground would probably start sinking, right? Maybe there'd be these large holes around these trees, but, but that's not the case. So what we're, have, we're, we're seeing is that um, these trees and these plants that you guys are growing in your gardens are coming from thin air. If you move your hands around right now, you're going to feel the nitrogen and the, the carbon dioxide and um, a lot of other uh, water vapor and other molecules that are in the air. So what's happening is, is through the process of photosynthesis, we're pulling in that carbon dioxide and um, pumping it into the ground in the forms of sugars. So that's one of the most fascinating things that I think we've, we've learned in, in the past uh, decade or so is that um, the, the sugars that were leaking from the roots of plants that we thought maybe might be a problem with the plant, problem with the tree, it's actually sharing sugars with the microbes inside of the soil and it's feeding the bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi that are, that are in the soil, allowing them to live and do their thing, releasing acids, breaking down rocks and, and um, clay and turning it into bioavailable minerals for the plants. Okay, so we have this process, this, this carbon trading system that's existed um, for 500 million years uh, of, of research and development of evolution that has gone into this process um, that through commercial agriculture is largely being destroyed because we're not getting as many uh, microbes in the soil and we're using a lot of chemicals. Um, as I'll show you in a moment here with mycorrhizal fungi, this is the, the, the link between fungus and roots. They're connected together. And they just kind of fuse right inside the root and start to deliver nutrients to the plants. You can extend the reach for nutrients and water of a plant by a thousand times by having a relationship with, with the mycorrhizal fungi. And it's very sensitive. And I have a little bit right here that I pulled out from the garden. It's kind of dangling. And um, you know, it's, it's holding on to the soil Oops, I just dropped on my desk. <laughs> but um, it's, it's got this connection here, as you can see the tiny little filaments uh, with the root and delivering nutrients uh, to, to the plant. Okay, so you can get a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and water um, through that fungi that you're building in the soil. Now, there are ways through um, what I do is Korean natural farming um, maybe someone can type that in the chat. The Korean natural farming, we call it KNF. We um, have ways that we're actually grabbing indigenous fungi from the forest, um, attracting it to rice, okay, and getting it to, to grow in a little, little thing of rice, and then adding it to um, compost and, and building it and multiplying it and then adding it into the garden. Um, this is a process that takes. A little bit of time and some skill but you're able to get that natural fungi from the forest and putting it into your garden beds where if you're buying soil from the store you're not getting that type of fungi inside of those bags of soil right you got to build it when you're doing composting um, like the mandolin was talking about 
uh, that's all broken up and everything when you throw it into the garden bed. So we got to build that fungal uh, network again. And how are we going to do it? You know, you can capture it from the forest or you could, you could go out and buy something and, and like this is the not as natural way, but this is a way to jumpstart your garden. Just like composting is a way to jumpstart your garden, right? Nature composts naturally, but you guys are doing it sort of artificially, but using the natural process. You know, and that's that's the thing that humans are able to do. We can we can accelerate the regeneration of our planet um, much faster than nature can do it. But we're using nature to do the process, right? So um, composting is one of those ways. This is mycos that I use. Um, I'll whenever I plant something in the garden, I'll sprinkle some of this in. And um, what this does is it's going to um, create that hyphal network. All right, and just sprinkle that in and um, help build those, um, that connection to the roots. Um, Mandolin, if you can put a, like just something in the chat as far as uh, how much time I have, that's good because I know I thought it was to 930. Can you tell me about that? You're good, you can continue on. Okay, all right. So we have this natural uh, delivery system that exists in the forest. And uh, we're thinking about you know, how we can uh, replicate that here in our gardens. And um, one of those ways is, is by introducing that fungi, like I mentioned. But as you can see here, my cute little bacteria, they don't really have eyes or mouths. Um, basically, they're just absorb things into their body and then they release acids and enzymes and they start to break down minerals. So we have a lot of, of minerals in the, in the ground and clay and, and so on. Even here in, in Florida, we have some clay and, and uh, sand. But the thing is, is the roots are not able to absorb those minerals until the microbes start breaking it down into bioavailable uh, nutrients. Okay, that's, that's the key is how do we get that process going? And one of the ways is, is getting the fungi in the soil, getting the bacteria into the soil and starting to multiply it so it's breaking it down and delivering it to the plants through that uh, nutrient delivery communication system um, of the, the fungi network. That's like the original internet, okay? It's, it's, there's communication going on, there's ex exchange of nutrients going on um, in the soil. But commercial agriculture, the vast majority of the way our food is grown, destroys that fungal network. Okay, here's the tilling, which is just breaking up the soil. Um, there's a lot of carbon dioxide now that's being released into the air. Um, you're taking the skin of the earth and you're just ripping it off and um, you have that exposed skin. And what happens if you guys get a cut, right? You're going to be losing water. Um, you're going to be, you know, you're bleeding. Um, here, the soil, it's, it's bleeding carbon. It's bleeding water. And uh, it's bleeding nitrogen. And it's going out into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. So um, we want to keep that fungal network. And the way we do it is by doing no-tilling methods, which I'll show you in a moment. But soil biology is required for minerals to be released for absorption. Okay, so plants don't don't digest soil. All right, just like humans, there's a lot of nutrients in our food that we don't digest. The microbes in our gut digest it and turn it into, into the nutrients that we need, into the medicine that we need. And that's the same here in the soil, is that um, not only do the microbes make the minerals and organic matter um, available to the plant, but when they feed on that nutrients, a single bacterium can produce up to 2,000 different compounds. We don't even know all the stuff that they do, but uh, largely what they do is they make um, antimicrobial compounds, antifungal, antipathogenic bacteria, antipathogenic uh, fungus, um, getting rid of fusarium uh, that can cause fusarium wilts in some of your plants. Um, so it's producing medicine in the soil. Okay, and that's what happens when we start feeding those microbes and, and multiplying them 
in the ground. Um, recently, we found that uh, the nutrient content of our food is quite lower than it was back in the, the early 1900s, as you can see here. And, um, you know, you'd have to eat two times as much meat, three times as much fruit, four to five times as much as veggies to get the mineral content of the food that was grown in soil um, back in the 1940s. Okay, and even then it was lower than it was uh, previous years. Um, so we're looking at um, nutrient levels that are just very, very much variable and uh, very different than they were back then. Um, they went to one farm. This is a Bionutrient Association. They've been studying different um, soil uh, farms around the country, and they found that there is there is some places where one spinach leaf was the equivalent to 14 spinach leaves and on another farm that had soil that wasn't as, um, as healthy. And so do you know when you go to the store, if you're eating that spinach leaf that has the equivalent of 14 spinach leaves and minerals? You don't know right now. And so um, there's a lot of variation that takes place. When you look inside of a, a reference guide and it says spinach has this much iron, um, that's, that's the best case scenario probably for you, okay? We don't realize how depleted our plants are. And, um, you know, it's really important. It's not just that, but also antioxidants. If you want to eat a food source that, like a tomato that has lycopene um, or any type of antioxidants, we're talking about, um, we're talking about, a big difference here between whether the food is just for sustenance or whether it's actually going to be for, um, you know, health and healing. All right. So um, the microbes make the nutrients available. So if you're interested in health, you have to be interested in soil. So when we're building soil, we got to make sure that it's, it's functional and that it's doing its thing. All right. So right now, most of our soil is really sick. Okay, it's got digestive problems because it doesn't have the microbes uh, levels in commercial agriculture to be breaking down the nutrients and making it available. It's got very poor circulation. With this compact soil, it's hard to deliver the oxygen and water to the soil. Um, it's hard to breathe, right? We're not getting that oxygen in there when we don't have the, the porous structure that's in there. All right, it's got difficulty filtering toxins and um, it's very dehydrated from the fact that it's not able to get a lot of water. Um, so there's a lot of problems that are happening if you don't have healthy soil. All right, so we want to get the biological diversity. We want to make it, you know, producing a lot of food, holding on to water, and pulling in carbon from the atmosphere. I'm going to just move a little bit faster. I haven't used Zoom before, so I'm having trouble looking at the chat. Um, I'm not sure where the chat is, but so if I'm just going to move for the chat, Jeff, it's in the bottom it says chat. If you put your mouse over it. Okay. All right. Oh, you're good. All right. Just let me know if someone asks a question. I have no trouble. <laughs> um, so if you look on the left and you look at the right, you can see that what Mandolin was talking about with soil aggregates. We want to go from 1% organic matter, which is what we typically have in a, a, a farm, to about up to 10, maybe even more. We don't even know how high the soil organic matter. So that's going to include the bacteria, the fungus. Um, it's going to be the plant matter that's being broken down that's in there. And all of that together is going to be forming that soil organic matter. All right, so we can go up. This is from the Riddell Institute. They're showing you like the differences here between 1% to 5% organic matter. And these are some soil aggregates. And this is what I'm gonna talk about in a moment. I have one right here that I got from my banana circle. And so what are these aggregates? Well, it's home for bacteria and fungi. So um, if you guys are on the... Uh, the camera, raise your hand if you've ever made kombucha or seen someone make it. You've seen a, a scoby, kombucha scoby. That's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. 
And so if you look at that SCOBY, that's created by a bacteria and yeast. It's like this super colony. It brings nutrients in, it delivers waste out. And um, they built that themselves over a very short amount of time. And so that's what's going on in our soil is that we have these soil aggregates, which are homes for bacteria and fungi. They're produced by them. They release all these sticky sugars um, from eating the sugars from the, the plants. And they're also going to um, use sugars that they make to help create structures. Um, they have their own little highway system of, of delivering nutrients that holds on to water. Um, and it's really cool because these aggregates are holding things together and they're holding on to clay and other nutrients so they can just slowly break it down and eat so they have their own food supply. But because they're in these like ball-like structures, as you can see here, if I put a bunch of these together and I hold on to these, yes, there's a lot of clumps, but there's also spaces between those clumps. And so now water is able to travel between that and it's in air, oxygen is able to travel between that, okay, where we didn't have that before. Um, a lot of our soil in, in our yards and in the, in the farms, it's very compact. Okay, it's really compact, so it's really hard for the soil to breathe. As, as I mentioned, we're having respiratory problems, um, infiltration problems when we don't have these aggregates. So even exactly. though they're really clumpy, they also let the water in the air go through. Hey, I'm just gonna give a five minute marker. Okay, great. So um, here's some uh, biological, uh, there's some pictures here under a microscope. And this is the fungal hyphae, okay, those threads going around the soil aggregate, as you can see, holding it together. And there's bacteria releasing sugars, holding it together. Glomulin is, is a sticky protein and it's, it's holding the soil together. So when we get that, I don't know if you can see my mouse here or not, but on the right, you get these little clumps and now you got the circulation. You got the water and the oxygen as opposed to on the left where it's really compact. And instead of going vertically going down, it's going horizontal and it's delivering uh, fertilizer and pesticides into the water supply, which is causing um, algae growth issues, um, killing the life in the water. It's a big problem. And so there's a big difference between compaction and, and that circulation that you get. For every 1% of soil organic matter that you're able to increase in the soil by, by doing composting, doing fertilizer teas and so on, um, each percent you're attracting another um, uh, 27,000 gallons per acre. Okay, so you do the math, you multiply it times, we go 1% to 5%, that, that soil is going to, um, that's a difference between holding on to 27,000 gallons per acre to 100,000 gallons per acre. And so when we look about, we look at droughts and so on that we have, um, we can get through those droughts. We have more resilient soil. Um, we have those aggregates in there, less likely to, um, to go dry. And so regenerative agriculture is learning about trying to re regenerate that soil, okay? Build it back. And there's so many wonderful things that can happen when you're working with nature protecting the soil, keeping that skin on there, and um, the diversity of plants, and just holistic approach where you're working with the microbes in the soil. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're, we're not disturbing the soil as much. We wanna get more living roots in the ground, more roots, you get more sugars, you get more microbes that are feeding on it, and you end up getting more minerals into your plants, which are gonna make your plants healthy and you healthy. Um, Integrating animals with compost or even just animals like a worm making compost tea, um, that's really important to building the soil. The armor is going to be your mulch that mandolin's talking about or cover crops. And the biodiversity is, is the biodiversity of the plants that you grow, the soil organisms, and, um, and the mulches that you might use. So you see the big difference here when you're not tilling, you got the biology going. Um, if we are able to convert all of the farmlands and lawns that we have now to a way where we're, we're feeding that soil and getting rid of the chemicals and building the microbes, we could pull in 
a gigaton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it into the ground. Okay, so you're not just building soil, you're also going to help reverse climate change by taking that carbon dioxide and putting it into the ground in the form of sugars um, that feed those microbes. All right, I have this little gun here and uh, <laughs> I use it to, to check the temperatures of the soil and, and I look and I can see that the bare soil is much higher than if we're using cover crops and growing plants. And so you're actually reducing the temperature of the air around you. Um, I use some hairy vetch during the, the fall winter months to help build a nice soil armor as well as the pine straw here. It worked really well. Now I'm using um, some of the uh, buckwheat here that's growing, it's beautiful. You really should cut it before it flowers to help get more this, the sugars in the ground, but I just wanted to try it and try some of the buckwheat. Um, but there's a big difference between, this is my yard a few years ago to it now, um, building that soil and uh, the temperature is different and a lot more plants growing in there. And I'm also feeding the clouds with water to help build that water cycle and get more rain in the, in the region. As you can see some pictures here. Um, even if you have a lawn and you're not looking to grow food, you can also just by adding worm compost tea, you can get um, a big difference. On the left here, this was with compost tea and, and just applying it to on the right, which is a typical yard that's only a few inches of, of topsoil. Harvard University, their campus complete, completely converted to using worm compost tea, no chemicals on the lawn. After six weeks, look at the difference between on the left and on the right, which was a satellite site away from the university that they own where they're using commercial uh, chemical fertilizers. A big difference in how you can build that root structure. Um, and so the compost tea is what I use. It's one of the popular things. I'm going to um, show you quick. Um, this comes from a worm that I put into a jar and a clean jar, and I, um, I just waited an hour or so for it to release the castings. So it's eating the, the fruit vet, fruits and veggies and everything, and then it's kind of like pooping it out. And I said, what does it look like under a microscope after it poops it out, right? So um, let me show you here. I think you guys can see that. And so if you can see all of that life that's in there. Worms are able to, to magnify microbes many, many times. And the, the bacteria that goes in um, comes out to where you get more good bacteria than bad bacteria. If there's any pathogenic bacteria before, it reduces that a lot and then it increases the good microbes. So now you take this, this is the worm castings, and then you put it into a bucket and add some, some molasses and some other nutrients and add some aeration, you're going to even multiply this even more. And then you take that and you spray it around into the garden and it's going to increase that soil biology, which is going to help your soil. So I think it's amazing to be able to look at this and see all of that life that's in there and um, to know that these guys are the ones that are going to be um, making your plants healthy, protecting against disease, increasing the nutrient density of your plants, making you guys healthier, and uh, giving you the ability to help fight off um, infections and diseases yourself. Okay, we got to help build more immunity, and that's a big problem that we're having with this virus, and we're noting a lot of people who are um, immune compromised are having problems. It's like, we got to get the nutrient density back in our plants, back into our bodies so we're going to be healthier as well. So um, I want to thank you, Mandolin, for having me here today. And I hope that gives you a little bit of inspiration for you in your garden. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your incredible knowledge, Jeff. Could you tell people where they can find you and contact you if they have any further questions or they want to work with you or get some advice from you? Yeah, no problem. Um, let's see. Here we go. 
I'm just going to pop this up here quick. Um, this is my, I think you guys can see that. This is uh, my information here. Um, this is where you can find me on social media, Nature Hacker, trying to, to hack the soil, right? Using nature to, uh, to hack things, modify, and make it more uh, nutrient dense, more healthier than ever before. If you guys want to check out Orlando Permaculture, please um, go to this site and uh, to learn a little more about, about me and, uh, and, our, and our organization. Um, if I can pop into the chat here, let me get out of here. There are um, a lot of thank yous waiting for you in the chat. <laughs> All right, I'm also going to just throw a bunch of stuff in here and um, tell you, okay, Bionutrient Association, they have a lot of wonderful videos from um, past uh, conferences where they're talking about building healthy soil. Um, here's Orlando Permaculture, Rodell Institute, love what they do. They're going to show a lot of great facts and information about the differences between like unhealthy soil, healthy soil. You guys need the facts. You guys need to be able to go out and show and show that this stuff actually works. Advancing Eco Agriculture, Don Kempf is amazing. He has a lot of great podcasts that you can watch about um, building soil. And Kiss the Ground, if you want to become a soil advocate like myself, um, and they have some great courses there that you can do. And if you're interested in that, let me know. I can get you a discount um, for being in there. So, um, you know, that's, those are some other sites you can just go to right now and start learning and absorbing just a lot of information. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jeff. So we are closing down, running out of time right now. And I wanted to guide everybody to the Facebook group. We have the Sustainable Kashi Community Facebook group. So if you just go on Facebook, type in Sustainable Kashi Community, we'll be posting the question from today in there. It's already posted. So you can hop on there and start communicating on there, really cultivating this beautiful micro fungal network that we've created here online. And um, I just wanted to state some more things of next week. We are going to be having an amazing guest speaker, Albert, talking about frugal living. So that's a really important thing to be focusing on during these times of facing scarcity within our society and how we can move into a more regenerative lifestyle focusing on frugal living. And also we have a donation part now, and that is. Where is that located, Amy? I'll post that as well. That'll be posted in the group as well. So if you feel free to donate to us in any way, we're definitely cutting back on a lot of programs that we've done and a lot of financial aspects of our program. So feel free to donate to these free classes. And what was that? <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll guide this and steer this into the Facebook group online on the Sustainable Kashi community page. And I do see that one hand is raised. Albert, do you want to say anything? Do you want to unmute yourself and say something? I think you're still muted. Okay. Um, uh, I just, I, I really enjoy, can you hear me? Yes. I really enjoyed the 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 talk. Uh, I just did. I wanted to mention something about uh, you mentioned uh, some sizes of compost, the three foot by three foot stuff, or something like that. I can't remember what you said. And uh, from my understanding, uh, and what I've been using um, is uh, that that four foot, you know, high, wide, and deep that's the kind of the limit for not having to turn because it gets hot enough and remembering that if you're smelling like a vinegary smell in your compost that means it's going anaerobic and you really got to do something and of course adding more uh carbon you know mulch or leaves or whatever helps but the size helps as well getting it really really as hot as possible mm -hmm. and uh, you know we don't not all of us have as much room as kashi so uh you know, that can be, uh, you know, we have to do what we can. Uh, but that's really what I wanted to say. And I'm looking forward to talking next week and, mm -hmm. you know, letting you guys know what I'm doing. And, of course, I'm building soil like crazy. 
honestly. That's that's number one. That's what I tell everyone. First thing you do, build soil. But thank you very much. Thank you, Albert, for sharing. That's definitely a great point. And you know, we use Kashi as an example, but we are all here to teach and share. So that's why the community page is so important that we can all share what we're doing individually on an individual scale and be able to share that information with one another. So I'm really excited for you to be able to speak to everybody next week. And that's gonna be our wrap for the day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our call today. And if you have any further questions or discussions, just make sure to guide that towards the Facebook group page. And we can all use that for communication. And we hope to see you guys next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Bye, everyone. So much love. Thank you for joining.